Now, for those of you who don't know Jordan, uh, he's a veteran researcher of over 50 years. He's a master of esoteric and occult knowledge, uh, whose areas of expertise include astrotheology, secret societies, and hidden Bible teachings and mysteries. And of course, my favorite, the truth behind modern religions. Now, that's a pretty interesting word there, religion. If you look it up, I looked it up on dictionary.com, uh, so I can give you the exact meaning. It says, a specific fundamental set of beliefs and practices generally uh, agreed upon by a number of persons or sects. So when we use the word religion throughout the broadcast, we're actually referring to the fundamental sets of beliefs and practices. Now, my biggest problem with religion, like any other group, is, of course, the groupthink involved. If you don't adhere to the beliefs, then you're either ridiculed, you're ignored, or just flat out excommunicated. And it's an institute of control, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's spiritual control. That's what it is. Much like its partner, government, which actually comes from the Greek word gubernatio, which means to control. And the word meant, which means the word mind. So if you take a look at the original Latinized Greek, government means control of the mind so uh, I bet a lot of you didn't know that out there and coincidentally you know as I was looking up the exact word for um, the definition of religion or the exact word for word definition of religion an article popped up on dictionary.com and the article asked the question of the real meaning of the word amen you know what you say after a prayer and very interesting article because for years I've been telling people that the word amen is actually the name of a, an Egyptian god of life and it's just amazing to see it right there on dictionary.com, which is uh, a somewhat mainstream website. So when you hear Christians and Jews and Muslims all the same and do their prayers with amen, they are actually praying to an ancient Egyptian god. And the point is, ladies and gentlemen, that you have to, you, um, that we've all been deceived. I mean, we've all been deceived on many levels. And if, um, if I told you the truth right now in a few sentences, you'd probably turn off your radio right now. So uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to have some great guests to talk about the true history of mankind, how we evolved, and how we've been influenced by, and it's not directly manipulated by alien beings. But we'll get more into that when we come back from the break with Jordan Maxwell. This is Truth Frequency with Chris and Cherie. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Truth Frequency on American Freedom Radio and Polygraph Radio. This is Chris and Sharia, of course. And joining us on the line, we have the legend himself, Jordan Maxwell. And I'm watching the chat room right now. Uh, you can join the chat at truthfrequencyradio.com if you'd like. But um, they're asking a question, who came first, God or religion? Well, God, of course. And then we made the religion after God made us. And then we started actually worshiping other beings instead of the true creator of the universe. Um, but, Cherie, why don't you uh, go into Jordan's bio before we bring him on the line? Okay. Uh, Jordan Maxwell has been uncovering these deep mysteries for over five decades and continues this past year with the documentary Moses the Lawgiver. His books and documentaries cover topics such as occult and religious philosophy. He has conducted dozens of intensive seminars, hosted his own radio talk shows, guested on more than 600 radio shows, and written, produced, and numer appeared in numerous television shows and documentaries, including three two-hour specials for CBS, as well as the Ancient Mystery series. All devoted to understanding ancient religions and their pervasive influence on world affairs today. Jordan, uh, it's a pleasure having you on the broadcast. Well, thank you very much. Uh, again, sorry that I missed the last week. I, uh, I I don't know what to say. I feel very bad about missing the program, but I'm happy to be on with you again this week. Oh, it's no problem. It's no problem. It's funny how the universe works because we had a great broadcast last week. I'm sure this week gave you plenty of time to think about even more stuff that you wanted to put on the broadcast. So I, I think it's, it's all going to work out for the best. Uh, let me ask you this. You just got back from the Vatican. Uh, how was that trip out there? Well, it was it was a very nice uh, for me, but uh, the Vatican, of course, is an incredible place. Kind of scary at night, but uh, it was a beautiful trip through Switzerland, and um, I was there for a little over six weeks, and I'd like to go back. But uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, the other problem I'm seeing is that we're getting a heavy, heavy feedback from uh, from your line. Okay. You call me back and do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. We can we can give you a call right back. All right. Is that better? I think so. Sounds good. Very good. Very good. Um, you so, know, 
anyway, the Vatican is an uh, is an incredible place. It's uh, absolutely ludicrous with uh, how how much riches are are right in your face in the Vatican. We had the opportunity to take the tour <coughs> from the uh, from the back. We we had a tour guide that got us into the Vatican, uh, the unorthodox way. We went through the back door and were able to go through all kinds of places that uh, a lot of the tourists don't go. And we saw the whole thing, but we were able to get into places where uh, regular tourists are not going. So it was quite an experience seeing that much lavish uh, power and money in your face. But uh, a lot of people, uh, I, uh, I know that there were a lot of people there were amazed at <clears throat> the uh, overwhelming awesomeness of the presence of the Vatican in Europe. And it is a very awesome presence. But most people don't know how it got to be where it is today. You know? And when you start getting into the history of the Vatican and the history of the whole church in Europe, going back to the 3rd and 4th century A.D., <clears throat> and seeing what has happened to Europe uh, and, and how the church became what it is today, that's a whole story in itself. A lot of people have no idea in the world, but... They just know it was an old church, but they have no concept of how it got the power and the and the money and the influence that it has today. And that's what I'm very interested in having people know about well, take where us on, all of this stuff came from. Take us on the journey. Um, where do we begin? Well, at the time of Christianity, when Christianity first shows itself <clears throat> on the earth, it was in the Eastern world, not in the West. And in Rome, at the time of Christianity, the, the basic religion of the Roman Empire was called Mithraism. Mithraism, you can look it up in any good dictionary or encyclopedia, look up Mithraism, and uh, it will tell you that was the main religion. There were many different religions in the Roman Empire, but that was the main Roman religion. It was, and Rome uh, was uh, pretty much the world of mankind in the Mediterranean area, and uh, so it became known as the Roman universal religion. Well, universal in Latin is Catholic. Catholic simply means a universal. So the Roman universal or Roman Catholic religion in the ancient Roman Empire was Mithraism. Mithra was a sun god who died in and who was resurrected and had uh, 12 followers and died for our sins, etc. And so all of the Mithraism teachings of the ancient Roman Empire became known uh, by as the Christian religion, and it became uh, it, it kept the same title of the Roman universal religion, but it just kind of took, uh, took Mithra out of the picture and put someone else in as the Messiah, but all the teachings of uh, Mithraism is today what we call Christianity. But unfortunately, so many people don't do that kind of homework. They don't study where things come from. And this is why uh, I've said so many times that with all of the troubles going on in the world and all the violence and bloodshed and wars and all the things which are destroying our civilizations on the earth, uh, religion is behind all of it, because ultimately uh, Europe has been dominated by the Vatican for, uh, or by Rome, I should say Rome has dominated Europe for about 3,200 years, and 2,000 years, and so uh, for Christianity. And so we're talking about, say, 3,200 years, uh, Rome and Christianity has dominated Europe. And Europe has, of course, dominated the Earth. So the Earth has been dominated by Europe, and Europe's dominated by uh, the Church. And the Church is actually a very old, ancient institution that Rome picked up from the pagan nations before it. So what we have today is one of the greatest, most powerful cults on the Earth. It was the cult of Mithra. And the cult of Mithra became the cult of Christianity. But within the scriptures, there's a, there is a hidden, when you get into the life of Jesus and get into the, uh, the history of the concepts 
of Jesus and what he did and where he went, etc., uh, there is obviously an encoded message in the New Testament, just as there is in the Old Testament. There's an encoded or symbolic story. <clears throat> and I think the story is absolutely astounding once you see the uh, the outline, you know, like... Um, like the movie, I, I watched the movie just recently, it was, struck me, it was called A Beautiful Mind, in which this doctor was able to see uh, pattern recognitions in newspapers and magazines where there were encoded messages. And that's exactly what you have to do with the New Testament. You have to look at it as an encoded symbolic story. And that story is very, very valuable. It's very impressive and important. But the church has taken that encoded story and put it into a historical uh, perspective and made it into a church. So I'm seeing it's totally different. The spiritual story of the New Testament, story of Jesus, has nothing whatsoever to do with the business or the corporation or the dominance of a political power called Rome. It's, it's two different uh, subjects completely. So while I, uh, I'm fascinated and I really am interested in the hidden story of Jesus, uh, on the other hand, I am totally turned off on the corporate world of big business, big churches, big money. And the Vatican, of course, is a political empire. It is political. <clears throat> it is a state among states. Well, let me ask so, you this. Let me ask you this. Did Jesus actually exist and then they took his story or was the whole story just made up completely? I think it's just my opinion that's based on 50 years of looking at this subject. I don't believe for a moment that Jesus actually existed as a man. I don't believe any of the, uh, the writers of the New Testament existed. I think the entire uh, New Testament story is a encoded symbolic metaphor. That's a metaphor for something very, very interesting and very important, but it was hidden in a metaphor what we call the New Testament. So I don't believe Jesus as a man actually existed. But actually that's not important because the metaphor of the story which I'm seeing is far more important as to whether Jesus himself actually lived or not. It's the story in the Bible that's important in the New Testament. And the New Testament, as I said, is a metaphor. Well, so is the Old Testament. The Old Testament is filled with symbolisms and, and innuendos, but especially symbols in relation to commerce and ownership and law. The Old Testament is a very, very powerful law document. It deals with courts and law and ownership of people, and uh, it's, it's a commercial document. And I see the New Testament as, uh, as an answer to that Old Testament commercial document. I see the New Testament as remedy at law. How to get out from under that Old Testament law, commercial uh, ownership of people, ownership of the humans. So I don't see it, I don't see the Bible as coming from God. I see the Bible, both Old and New Testament, as documents uh, put into the world politically and religiously, but especially politically, uh, by very powerful secret societies and fraternal orders. And we know from history, anyone who bothers to read about the history of Europe knows it's just crammed filled with secret societies and Knights Templars and the, all of the different fraternal orders operating within the Catholic Church. And there's some really serious stuff going on uh, in that department. And secret societies operating in the Vatican, you have Opus Dei, Propaganda Due, P2 Lodge of Freemasonry in the Vatican. Uh, you have all the Knights of Malta. Then you have a huge amount of, of smaller secret societies, fraternal orders, operating in governments around Europe and around the world that are dedicated to the overthrow of different governments for the Vatican. Uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting story. As a matter of fact, there's a movie, Disney, came out oh, about four or five years ago with the, the latest uh, Zorro movie. 
and in the movie Zorro, you can get it still today and watch it, the whole movie of Zorro is about how secret societies connected to the Vatican were trying to overthrow the state of California when it was founded. And it shows the secret societies meeting their Masonic symbols and emblems and listen to what they're talking about. They're talking about the sovereignty of the American people, the sovereignty of the California state citizen cannot be allowed and that the governments and the secret societies of Europe will not allow this, uh, this to go on. This, this idea of sovereignty and freedom of the American people has to be overthrown. Europe is not going to stand for this. And I thought, that's interesting. It's right there in the Disney movie, Zorro. So there's a lot of uh, this kind of knowledge about the secret orders uh, within the Vatican and all around the Vatican and operating for the Vatican all over the world, in Germany and Europe and Asia, Africa. So the Vatican is a very powerful institution, but it's the reason why it's so powerful and the reason why it's so pervasive is because it's Rome. It's the Rome of the Caesars. And if you go back to the Roman Empire, you will find out it was a very powerful, dominating, uh, oppressive system of uh, government. Well, let me, let, me, let me back up. we still have. Let me back up for a second, because um, we just made a huge jump uh, from two different ideas. First, we were talking about Mithra worship, which is, of course, worship <laughs> yeah. of the sun. And that's right. why Christianity practices their holy day on Sunday. <laughs> they don't that's even right. try to hide it. But then we jump into commerce. Um, yeah. So originally, were they actually yeah. worshiping the sun? Or... No, 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 no. Then once you get into the, once you have accepted the idea that, that a particular uh, institution, man-made institution, represents God, uh, this is why, of course, kings have a divine right of kings in Europe, a divine right of kings. What are you talking about, divine right? Who, who, who can bestow a divine right on the king? Well, it's the Vatican who, the who, uh, who anoints kings in Europe to be kings or princes because they have a divine right, meaning the Pope speaks for God. And therefore, if the Pope speaks for God, if he anoints you, then you have a divine right to rule. Well, he can, he can just as easily remove you by divine right. So once you see and once we accept that the Pope has absolute sovereign authority over all mankind, which is what the Vatican has said over and over in their documents that the Pope has absolute sovereign control over all life on the earth, man uh, and animal, period. Because Jesus was given the earth by God, and uh, but Jesus is not here, so he needs someone to step in to own the earth till he comes back, and so that word is a vicar, and therefore the Pope is called the vicar of Christ. He stands in for Jesus because Jesus is not here, but God has given the earth to Jesus, so therefore the Pope will, until Jesus comes back, the Pope will himself own the earth and all life on it, because so the, he has a divine right from his God in Rome. So, uh, so, the, the, Pope is, uh, so the Pope's basically our divine babysitter? Yeah, that's it. Divine babysitters for the earth and all life on it, all animal life, all life in the sea, all life of, of humans, all life on the earth is in the hands of God. And God gave the earth to his son, Jesus Christ, the sun god. And, and, uh, but Jesus is not here right now. And so until he gets back, he has to have someone take care of the property. And so the, anyone who would step in for a Messiah is referred to in Latin as a vicar. A vicar is one who stands in for. Well, so the Pope is standing in for Jesus right now. So whatever he says the law is, that's what the law is. And whoever he anoints as king, that's God speaking. And so you can see where the corruption, because one of the British state, statesmen said, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, today, all over Europe and the world, uh, our power structures are absolutely corrupt. America is probably the most corrupt of all of them. Well, who is the government? All the, all the governments of the world are profoundly dark and occult, uh, corrupted systems of finance, money, political power, violence. And the Vatican, of course, rises as, uh, as king over the, all of Europe. 
So now, who is the god they worship, though? Is it gold, oil, and dollars? Actually, you know what? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> let's, I like uh, that. Let's take a quick break, and I'm going to get to that question when we come back. Uh, we're speaking with Jordan Maxwell, ladies and gentlemen. TruthFrequencyRadio.com is our website, and we'll, and welcome back to Truth Frequency on American Freedom Radio. We are speaking with the legend himself, Jordan Maxwell. And uh, we're talking about the Vatican and the power, which is Rome, and who the Pope represents. And before we got, um, before, before we got hit with a break, um, I was asking Jordan a question. Jordan, the question was, uh, who is the Vatican actually representing? Um, and I made the comment. It, actually, I have to credit it to Danny because he's the one that, that, that told me. God, um, gold, oil, and dollars. But who are they actually worshiping? Uh, the Vatican is actually dominated by the worship of, a, of an ancient... Um, ancient god called Dagon, D-A-G-O-N. Dagon was referred to as a fish god because he came out of the sea, which goes all the way back to Samaria and into the ancient uh, writings of some of the religious movements of the ancient and prehistoric world. This god who came out of the sea, Dagon, <clears throat> and the symbols of the that the Pope wears of the is of the god Dagon. Uh, I, you know, my whole family was Catholic. I came from a Catholic family. And my mother had uh, had an uncle who worked in the Vatican at the time when I was growing up as a little kid. And so, uh, I'm not condemning the Catholic people. I'm just talking about the actual organization that we call the Vatican, how it got to be, what it is, and where it came from. So Rome has always been involved with the worship of Dagon, <clears throat> and Dagon, as I said, was a fish god. This is why the Pope's uh, mitre is a fish head, and, and, and it's very obvious when you see, when you look at the mitre from the side, <clears throat> it's a fish head. And all of the symbols, like today, even in Protestant Christianity, which is actually just the offspring of the original Dagon worship, I just the Protestant movement was not happy with the way that Rome was running things. It did not want to change the religion and drop the worship of Dagon and all the other silly nonsense that Rome was into religiously. It did the Protestant world movement did not want to drop any of that because that stuff works. It it was a, it was a winner. I mean the the crowds loved it. So they didn't want to change and do anything spectacular in changing the worship of Dagon. They just didn't like the way Rome was running things. So they broke off and started a, a new uh, phase of the old Roman religion. They called it Protestantism because they were protesting against the way Rome ran Europe. <clears throat> so today, even the Protestant churches of the world are worshiping Dagon and uh, and and the worship of this ancient god is everywhere, and this is why even uh, being a fish god, this is why on the back of Christians' cars you will see a fish symbol. We're told that that was a symbol of uh, <coughs> of early Christianity was a fish symbol. Mm -hmm. Well, of course it was a name. It was the symbol for Christianity because Christianity was the worship of Dagon or uh, in astrological terms, Pisces. Pisces was always uh, was always a symbolized by a fish, or two fish, and all through the Catholic Church and all through Protestant churches, everywhere you will see Jesus with two fish, and uh, and because Jesus or the story of of uh, Jesus is based on Dagon, the fish god. That represented uh, and was and was connected to the worship of Pisces, the fish. Well, he fed the crowds. So Pisces is called the great fisherman. He fed the crowds with a loaf of bread and two fish. And two fish. The two fish is uh, is um, the symbol of Pisces. The two fish. And in Luke twenty two ten in the Bible in the New Testament. Uh, when Jesus uh, is is going to be uh, commemorating what they call the Last Supper, uh, uh, the last meal, the Passover meal, uh, the apostles ask Jesus, and this is a symbolic metaphor, but the apostles ask Jesus, where are we going to go now that you're going to die? Now that you're going to leave us, where are we going to go? And... And he says back 
go into the city and you will see a man with a water pitcher. A man carrying a water pitcher. Go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. Well, anybody that knows astrology knows the next sign after Pisces is Aquarius, always symbolized by a man with the water pitcher. And so it was a symbolic story that the sun, that thing that comes up in the morning that brings light into the world, the sun was in the age of Pisces under Jesus. But now that Pisces is leaving the world, there's a new uh, constellation coming on the earth. The new one is the age of Aquarius. So the sun now tells his 12 helpers, the 12 apostles, which are actually the 12 months of the year or the 12 signs of the zodiac. And so the 12 signs of the zodiac or the 12 followers of God's son ask uh, him, where are we to go if you're going to leave us now in the age of Pisces, the two fish, where are we going to go? And he says, go into the city where you will see a man with a water pitcher. Go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. Well, that's the house of Aquarius. So I'm saying that the entire story of the New Testament is a metaphor. Hmm. It's a symbolic story explaining the, uh, the whole concept of the astrological story, which as far, as far back as you can go in history, the most ancient story on the earth is called astrotheology. And all people who have studied uh, religion know, even the priest and the clergy, they know about astrotheology and about the, the beginnings of Christianity and where this stuff has come from. They know that. But they have a job to do. They're being paid a salary. Their, their life depends on. They're in an organization. Just because you're working for Sears or General Motors, does not necessarily mean you love General Motors, but it's your job. So if you're going to talk about uh, cars in public, you talk about the boss and, and, the, and the company you work for. You may not like it, but at least they are your boss, and they're the ones that you're getting your paycheck from. And so the, the, you know, all the clergy, almost all the clergy I've talked to privately, they say, yeah, we know the whole thing is, is based on astrology and the astrological symbols of the sun and the 12 signs of the zodiac and all of that, it's overwhelmingly obvious to anybody that studies it. The entire superstructure of Western civilization is based on occult uh, astrology, occult symbols, mystical symbols, words and terms. But the masses of the people have no idea in the world because, and the reason why the people <clears throat> in Western civilization do not know any of this, and it's foreign to hearing most people are hearing me, this stuff is totally foreign. And I understand that. It's because this kind of subject, which I have been looking at for 50 years, this kind of subject has nothing to do with basketball, football, tennis, golf balls, uh, soccer, nothing to do with all the silly games that our masters have given us kids to play with. Give them a ball and let them go out and play so that they don't think too much about what the bosses are doing behind the scenes. Well, I never bought into this, go out and play ball, even as a child. I didn't want to go out and play ball when, when, when friends were coming over to visit my family and they would tell us kids, go out and play ball. That, to me, even as a kid, I knew. It means the adults want to talk about something and they don't want you children hearing it. I wanted to stay. I would always tell my dad, I don't want to go out and play ball. I want to know what you guys are talking about in the front room when the women are out in the kitchen. I want to hear what the men are talking about because that's where the action is. <laughs> and so I don't, want to, I don't want to be out watching a ball game while the people who claim to be our masters and own us are playing games with our lives behind the scenes and manipulating us, and we are so stupid we buy into it. I have never bought into stupidity and ignorance. I've always known that there's, there's more to the story than meets the eye. Well, they did that even back in Rome. Um, to well, distract they everybody, they would have big games at the Colosseum. That's right. We still have it in L.A. Everybody goes to the Colosseum. And we have uh, cage fighting and martial arts and, you know, and uh, all these on the Holy See. When you understand what the Holy See, uh, where the Pope sits, is called the Holy See. The word see in that context is a chair, the holy chair, where the Bible says that the, that the, 
that the dark forces of the world sit on the holy chair that's overseeing the, the seas of the world. The seas of the world are the people. The blood of humans is everywhere. So the holy sea is actually the holy institution that is guiding the whole human race. And Vatican has been very heavily involved in Russia, in China, in Japan, all over Asia, all over Africa. The, the Vatican is behind so many of the political movements, the Knights of Malta, the Knights, uh, uh, the Masonic Order of Knights, uh, throughout the Roman Empire have been behind the founding of governments, revolutionary governments, especially Central and South America, Brazil, Argentina. That's why the uh, South America and Central America is just covered with Nazi uh, secret societies, Opus Dei, uh, to name a few, Propaganda Due, P2, all of these secret societies operating behind world governments, all are directly being influenced by some kind of a very powerful presence in the world that is in position of authority so that millions of people follow and never ask any questions. And once in a while, like in ancient history and through history, once in a while there will be someone who will stand up and say, what is all this stuff really all about? Who's really running the Vatican? Where is all this stuff? The, the, who's really financing the Nazi party and Adolf Hitler? What is the connection between Hitler and the Nazi movement and the Vatican, because, boy, there is a big one. Then you've got to find out, what is the connection between the Vatican and the rise of communism in the world? Is there, a, is there an actual, factual connection between the Vatican and Nazism, communism, and, uh, and the uh, fascism? Well, once you start going down that road, now you've got to ask, what is the connection between America and the Vatican that you don't know anything about? when it's right in your face. In the ancient Roman Empire, Rome was ruled by the Senate. Well, we have a Senate. And the Vatican, uh, the Vatican Dome represented uh, something called the Domas. The Vatican Dome is the, is the model for the Washington, D.C. Dome. Life magazine, I still have the magazine, did a whole article on the Vatican Dome as the model for the United States Capitol Dome. And how uh, and the history books said that Caesar each morning would go up on the hill. And so Caesar ruled the, the, uh, the Senate from what is referred to as Capitol Hill. In Rome, there is such a hill that's called Capitoline Hill or Capitol Hill. And that was a seat of power where the Senate was uh, was located well that's today we have a senate up on the hill and we have uh presidents who are like the vatican like like uh, standing in for the vatican they are like god they think themselves to be absolute divinely inspired gods when america was supposed to be the land of the free and home of the brave we're not free or brave we are maritime admiralty products uh, people who are crawling on their knees to the Vatican. And we have a Senate of uh, the way, and we know that our American uh, judicial system, the, the laws in America, our governmental systems, our finances, we know, Americans know, in a gut level, it's all corrupt. It's all mafiosi, gangsters. It's all money buying and selling people. It's all a very violent and dirty world of international politics and big money. We finally figured that out. Well, I knew that 50 years ago, listening to my uncle and listening to my family. So once you understand how corrupt America really is and how far gone we are as a, as a great republic, we, we no longer have the freedoms that we started out with. Jordan, Jordan, hold that thought. We're coming up to another break. We'll be right back. We're speaking with Jordan Max. And welcome back to Truth Frequency on American Freedom Radio. And we are speaking with Jordan Maxwell, talking about the Vatican, the powers behind governments, and uh, how governments are given their power by divine. So, um, 
You know, Jordan, let me ask you this, though. Let me jump back a little bit, because we were talking about the power behind the Vatican, but there seemed to have been a little split there at one point in time uh, with the Knights Templar. Um, now, the Vatican, at least from what I understand, the Vatican created the Knights Templar uh, to be basically their assassins, and then they yep. turned on the Knights Templar. Oh, well, because the Knights Templar turned on the Vatican. They, they, they felt, it seems to be, as uh, what happened is that the Templars were doing all the dirty work and collecting all the jewels and, and material uh, treasures from the raping the earth and giving it to the Vatican. And they decided, why are we doing that? Why don't we just keep it ourselves? The hell with the Pope and the hell with the Church. We'll just do it ourselves because we're the ones. Well, that's the same kind of thinking uh, that goes on with the mob, with the mafia. You know, you're out there on the street, and all of a sudden some of the soldiers begin to think, why are we feeding the old man? <clears throat> Why don't we just start our own movement, our own operation? We call it international bankers. We don't need the Vatican. And now, all of a sudden, there's a rift in, in the great mob rule because the old man is losing power over the young Turks, and the young guys are coming in who are doing the dirty work. They want to keep all the, the stuff for themselves. So there's always going to be this kind of uh, infighting and internecine battles going on in underworld organizations, Mafia, Lagosa Nostra, there's always going to be this kind, and of course Mafia is Italian, so uh, the, uh, that's what the the whole story of uh, Godfather 3, if you go and get the third in the series of Godfather, you'll see the Mafia directly connected to the Vatican in the Vatican, dealing directly with the Holy Father, dealing directly with the Pope, and uh, it's an extraordinary story of how it's right there in your face in the movies. Francis Ford Coppola, uh, in his third movie, uh, Godfather Three, is telling you a lot right there in the movie in your face. But so many people see it, and it's just entertainment. They have, they don't make the connection. It's very obvious to me. Uh, to me, well, the it's Knights always been very obvious. The Knights Templar weren't they the first banking system? Yes, they were, absolutely, and they are still the banking system today. They are still, in fact, the, the major bankers of the world belong to the Fraternal Order of Knights Templar, and uh, it's a Masonic uh, operation throughout Europe and ultimately throughout the world. This is why all banking systems, I mean, I, get a, I do a whole thing, and you know, you've probably heard it many times, a whole thing on the banking system and where the words come from. Why do you have a bank? <clears throat> What is investment? What does that word mean? Where does it come from? Where does it come from? And where do courts come from? You begin to see how the Vatican dominates our American court system. So if you don't like the courts, if you don't like the crooked politicians, if you're not happy with all of the heinous treason, high crimes and treason against the Republic, which is going on right now in what we call Washington, D.C., then you had better look at the concept of the Senate, Capitol Hill. You had better look on each side of the podium where the speakers in the House stand and give speeches, where you will see that the fasci is about an eight-foot high symbols on each side of the podium where the president stands to give his State of the Union message, and you will see two Roman fascists directly out of the old ancient Roman system of fascist government is right here in the Senate, right here in America. It's actually on the seal of the United States Senate. It has two fascists, the symbol of world fascism in the United States Roman Senate. So Rome, the, the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman system of Mitra or Dagon is now dominating the American system. We don't have anything happening in this country which is American. You have two political parties, and the reason why you have only two is because the eagle, the American eagle, is the same as the symbol for Rome. The Roman symbol in the ancient Roman Empire was the eagle. So we still have the Roman eagle, but eagles only have two wings, left wing and right wing. They only have two wings. This is why in America you can only have a left-wing and right-wing government, because the entire system that we are operating on the, in America is a Roman fascist system. Well, you can and take that has, symbol. Has, you can take it that. It has totally destroyed our American republic. We are so incredibly ignorant, incredibly uninformed, 
and profoundly unread. We've been entertained with all of our games and alcohol and all of our entertainment, never realizing for a moment that the entire superstructure of America as a fascist Roman system under the Vatican, meeting up on Capitol Hill with the Senate, the entire superstructure of America is a very filthy and dirty system coming out of the ancient Roman Empire, and we're still today in America, both Catholic churches and Protestant churches, on our knees worshiping Dagon, the fish god, and Mithra, the old ancient sun god. And I'm telling you that as long as America is on its knees to its masters, its Roman masters, worshiping the old ancient Roman gods, and then we have the audacity to actually ask God for protection and divine guidance, uh, it's, it's ludicrous on the face of it. America is lost because she is crawling on her knees to her masters of Rome and have no idea in the world what's going on. They're not, Americans are not very well read. They're profoundly ignorant when it comes to law and how governments work, how banks work. I'm just amazed at how far gone this great republic has lost all of its freedoms, its dignity, its honor, it's lost everything, and our Roman masters sit in the Vatican uh, in absolute opulence and luxury, dominating Europe, dominating the world, and in fact dominating our great republic, and the people of our country have no concept at all and what's going on at all. All we know is we are dying, we're starving, our republic is crashing, our money is corrupt, our politicians are corrupt, you're looking at the fall of the Roman Empire. And yet, the most incredible part of this is the people love it. You, would, you will never get the people to understand who their real enemy is. The American people love crawling on their knees to their masters. They love it. They cannot get enough of the Vatican, the Holy Father. When the, when the Holy Father comes here, everybody falls all over themselves to get next to him to touch him. So I'm just saying we're in a mess and because we're so profoundly ignorant. Let's take another quick break, ladies and gentlemen. We are speaking with Jordan Maxwell. We're going to have a longer segment when we come back, and we'll get to some of your questions from the chat room. Uh, TruthFrequencyRadio.com is the website. We are speaking with Jordan Maxwell. Um, we have a couple of questions from the chat room, Jordan, if you don't mind uh, taking a few. The first okay, one is... On. Before, yeah, before we do that, I would just say, if you go to my website, jordanmaxwell.com and go to the button at the top of the page that says what's new and scroll down and you will see two videos that I highly suggest one is a video one is not uh, but two products I would suggest if you're really interested in this story uh, the two products that I have that are, that are filled with this kind of stuff is called the priesthood of the Elias the priesthood of the Elias is a DVD which is actually three books, old typewritten manuscripts, but they're three different books written by the same man, not by me. And these three books uh, I put together as to one book on, on a DVD called Priesthood of the Elias, in which uh, this is a very old publication back in the 30s. And, uh, but what this guy has done, and I, fa I found it to be absolutely fascinating, as he took all of the words and terms that Rome used and the church has used during the Middle Ages, during the Dark Ages, uh, all the Protestant church symbols and words and terms and showed where they came from, the etymology of the words and the, and the foundation of the concepts, showing them to be maritime admiralty concepts, the way the church was set up how the Knights Templar set up the banking and words and terms and symbols and emblems. It's an incredible array of knowledge on the world of the occult in world religion. It's called Priesthood of the Elias. It's on my website. And beneath it is a second uh, video I did uh, called Dawn of a New Day. I don't know if you've seen it yourself, Dawn of a New Day, but oh, yes, yes. it's explaining uh, in detail the kind of thing I'm talking about in relation to uh, how the Rome, how the Roman system dominates the earth today. And of course, in the, at the very first thing you will see on that 
what's new page is the hidden dimension of world affairs and you can see it's about the Vatican. So I have a lot of material that uh, that you can get right now that's documented stuff, especially that priesthood of Elias, three bucks typewritten manuscripts on the very subject we're talking about now. And you've released all of your research files, correct? Yes, I have. That's uh, that was all one computer. I have six computers with uh, with uh, with in, you know incredible amount of material on all of them. This was one of the research files I have, which has like three and three point four gigabytes, one hundred sixty one folders, five thousand eighty items. Uh, that's just one folder, but uh, and I've got more coming. Well, this is over 5,000 uh, documents and uh, materials, research materials. So on the what's new on my website, jordanmaxwell.com, a lot of stuff dealing directly with what we're talking about right now. Yeah, and, and support Jordan, ladies and gentlemen, because when you do this kind of thing, you don't get rich, you go broke, and you go broke very fast. And no doubt about he's it. He's dedicated his life to bring you all of this knowledge. So pick up a couple of DVDs. Not only are they a good watch, but you're supporting a very, very talented researcher. Um, Jordan, you mentioned the Knights Templar again, and I, I want to go back to that because I'm trying to understand this. There was a split, like we were talking about here. Friday the 13th, the Vatican ordered all of the Knights Templar dead. The Knights Templar yeah. were the first banking system. It did, how, did that, how did the two groups come back together? Well, I think, you know, that's the way... Again, that's the way uh, organized crime operates. You know, they have they have uh, blood feuds as to who's going to run the organization when one when the big man dies, like in the time of Al Capone, and uh, so there's a lot of blood feuds on the street to see who's going to run the mob now that the boss is gone. Uh, but once everything has settled down, it's business as usual, just like the mafia said. And there's nothing personal in any of this; it's just business. And so ultimately, it's just business. Sometimes you have to end up realizing that your opponent that used to be your friend uh, that used to work for you is now himself very powerful. And so now uh, it just requires that you work, you know, do what you have to do and grit your teeth and, and deal with, with somebody who is now your, your opponent in the, in the world of business. So the Vatican has always operated behind the, the scenes of the world politically and monetarily, but especially politically, uh, because religion is a very big tool, as you well know. There's wars going on today in the Middle East based on religion, based on theology, and that's, this is where the real trick is. Once you understand the basis for theology and religion, and where these religious movements have come from, uh, and how they're being used by the secret societies promoting these different religious movements, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and uh, and Islam. Those people, you know, those three religions are called people of the book. The reason why is because all three of those religions rely on a book, unlike Hinduism and uh, and Buddhism and other philosophies of the East, more philosophical and spiritual in their in their orientation but the three religions of the west uh, so to speak uh, you know christianity judaism and islam rely on a book so they call the people of the book and as far as i'm concerned it's just what i've looked at for fifty years i don't believe for a minute that even mohammed existed i don't think mohammed ever existed i think that was a uh, a story that was dreamt up by the Jesuits and and uh, perhaps even a more secret society behind the Jesuits before they were incorporated. I think the Vatican is ultimately responsible for what we call today uh, Islam. I think it was a Roman uh, development for and given to the Arabic peoples. And uh, we know that there's the Catholic Church and Vatican has been heavily involved in the affairs of the Middle East and the Arabic nations behind the scenes with the Knights Templars, because that's what they were doing there with the Crusades. So I don't believe Jesus existed. I don't, uh, I, but I'm not in any way uh, saying that the New Testament is not important. It is a very important book. It's telling you some extraordinarily important uh, things about life 
but it's encoded. You have to understand how to read the symbols. And once you do begin to see the encoded story in the New Testament, it begins to make a lot of sense. All the stories begin to make sense. Because there's so much in the New Testament story of Jesus that absolutely defies imagination. I mean, why does Judas go out and kiss Jesus? Uh, you know, why is one man going out to kiss another? And, uh, and the Christians will tell you, well, that's why Judas went out to kiss Jesus to identify him so he could be arrested. That's not what the scripture says at all. It doesn't say that. It says Judas went out to betray Jesus, to kiss Jesus to betray him, not to identify him. And that goes back to a very ancient story of betrayal by the, by the uh, scorpion, which is Scorpio, the constellation of Scorpio, is the backbiter. The backbiter who gives Jesus, or God's son, the kiss of death uh, because he is going to die in winter. It's a very ancient metaphysical story based on astrotheology that's been rewoven into an encoded story we call the New Testament. But as long as you do not know that encoded story, and as long as you're accepting that story as actual history, then you're going to be part of what is referred to today as the world of Babylon the Great confusion. It's all a bunch of babble. So the stuff that you, all you need to do to confirm this is to go watch a Christian radio or television. Go watch a, a TBN and watch the incredible babble silliness selling junk and, and toys and jumping on the stage and singing hymns and doing backflips and breaking bricks and all kinds of silly things to entertain the masses while nothing of any intellectual value whatsoever is being given to anyone. So as far as I'm concerned, Christian television is a mockery of the human race. And if there was a God, it's mocking the very creator by, by entertaining people with silliness and stupidity. Well, absolutely. I, on the other hand, am very interested intellectually and spiritually in the deep understanding of scriptures and what it's actually saying to us. You know, there's a scripture that has Jesus saying, by their fruits you shall know them. Well, what is the fruitage of the Vatican if it is not wars, violence, revolutions, uh, murder, people burning people at the stake, prisons, uh, all of this whole monstrosity that we had in America under the Bush's regime. The Bushes were very pro-Nazi with their uh, the Gestapo SS tactics, waterboarding, all of the incredible Nazi tactics, connections to the Nazi party. And even we know that Prescott Bush uh, himself was one of the financiers of Adolf Hitler. So the Bush family were very, very in-your-face Nazi, SS, Gestapo, and they ran this great republic like Adolf Hitler would. And then, of course, when we got, when we found that people finally figured out that uh, the Bushes are nothing but a bunch of Nazis, then they went for Obama, who came directly out of Moscow. Uh, it's an incredible story of we're going from left to right, from one hand to the next, and having no idea in the world what we're doing. The whole world loved Obama, never realizing that the people who are behind Obama, like Zvigny Brzezinski and all the other people who were the financiers and the manipulators behind the scenes to put Obama into power, were themselves Soviet communists, taught and trained under Soviet communism, Bolsheviki communism, it's just an incredible array of stupidity that this country has been wallowing in from going from Nazism to communism to fascism. We keep trying to make these things work. They have never worked. Hitler collapsed. The Communist Party collapsed in Russia. But thank God America's here. We'll just keep pushing Nazism and fascism and communism and all the other totalitarian fascist systems trying to make this crap work. Well, it's a it democratic an dictatorship, for sure. It would be interesting just to go back and watch and, and run this country like Americans. That would be a clever idea, just to run it like the original Americans you know, who founded the country. I'd like to see a country run, run by Americans instead of foreign people who represent the Vatican and who represent the mafia. 
I'd like to see this country run by Americans, just for the hell of it, just for a couple of, couple of years to see what would happen. <laughs> so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this entire superstructure of, of America is a very, very dark and evil, corrupt system based on Rome, based on the Vatican, and based on the worship of pagan gods. Uh, it's all over and everywhere in your face. Look at the, uh, like I said, by their fruits you shall know them. All you have to look do is look at the symbolism behind them. I mean, it's oh my just God, it's all everywhere. over the place. And we have a great question from the chat room. Uh, it, somebody asked, on your recent trip, did you happen to see the many sculptures of the pine cones, um, which are basically the pineal glands everywhere? That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the courtyard aerial view, which appears to be a keyhole? And does yes. this relate to the Temple of Solomon, which appears <laughs> to represent the sexual union of man and woman? That's right. It all is very much so. As a matter of fact, the uh, the whole courtyard, and, and it's on my website, actually. I've got a lot of information on that. Yes, it is a keyhole because the uh, you know the Pope holds the two keys, um, the key to heavenly power and the key to earthly power. Uh, they are crossed, and uh, all of that is very well known. And if you go on, as a matter of fact, if you go on my website, uh, to the links and scroll down on my links page to a section called uh, religion theology uh, the first entry is a very big I, I made it very large so you can't miss it it's called christianism.com and go to christianism.com on my links page under religion and theology and it's only about 6,500 pages of documents on everything to do with religion, where the words came from, who founded what, who financed what, what these words mean, who were these secret societies. Over 6,600 pages of documents was put together by a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine uh, in San Diego. He's a doctor, and he put this thing together, and it's a mind blower. He's traveled all over the world for many years, researching the Vatican, religion, uh, the Bible, where all of these things have come from. It's, an, um, it's a mind-blowing experience, and it's for free. It's right there on the web if you just go and sit for the next couple of years and go through 6,600 pages plus about 35 or 40 links that he has on his website. So there's just an awful lot of material out there, but most people are too busy watching basketball to fool with any of it. Besides, it doesn't make much sense because it has nothing to do with soccer or you know or <laughs> anything else that we're considered to be very important right now. Absolutely. Uh, our yeah. listeners, though, are tuned in with a lot of questions. Uh, let me go to one more from them. Um, what is the current situation of the Black Pope? Oh yes. Well, they they they've just changed. Uh, they've changed chairs here just recently. Uh, the the man who was the Black Pope. The Black Pope is simply uh, the 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 Jesuit general, the man who was in charge of the Jesuits. And God knows that's a story right there in itself. Who are the Jesuits? What are they? And and what part do they play in the downfall of America? What part do they play in the uprisings and murder? for hire in, uh, in Central America, Mexico, uh, the drug cartels, meddling drug cartels in Colombia. What part did the Jesuits play for the Vatican and for the Knights Templars in the world of white slavery, uh, pornography, drug running, murder for hire, all of the most incredible, filthiest, and dirtiest stuff in the world Jesuits are involved in? And the church is involved in it. We know that the Catholic Church is involved in all kinds of pornographic stuff and drug running and murder for hire and overthrow of countries. There's a lot of stuff that people just don't know. And unless and until we look up and find out what this whole Roman institution that's dominated the globe for over 3,000 years, until we wake up and find out what America was supposed to be, and why the Founding Fathers had to do it over here and leave Europe to come here for freedom, and why, why is it that when America was founded, the Catholic Church was not allowed to operate in this country? 
That is a fact of history. The Catholic Church was outlawed when this country was first founded and was not allowed to operate in America. When, in fact of law, in point of fact, it is today running the whole planet. The whole planet. And so I, I'm just amazed at how much we don't know and how much we don't care to know. And that's why, incidentally, I'm, I'm going to start very soon. I'm going to start a private club where it's going to be a research society, a research club, and uh, people will have to join it. Uh, because I don't, I'm tired of just talking to the masses, because I'm 70 years old. I don't have many more years on this earth. I've spent 50 years pursuing this kind of knowledge. I am aware, uh, I'm painfully well aware, that the majority of the people on the earth couldn't care less about anything I'm talking about. I know that, and especially in America. It has nothing, as I said, to do with sports. So there are some people in this country and around the globe who are awakened and who are intellectually enlightened to know that there's something drastically evil going on on the earth and want to know. So I'm setting up, and I'm in the process of doing it right now, a research organization whereby you can come to get tons of material. I'm, I have boxes in storage in my garage of incredible materials, documents and pictures, diagrams of how this system works, how the government works, how banks work, how the religious operations uh, of the churches operate the behind the scenes with the mafia, with the underworld, with the international gangster movements around the world. It's, I had an FBI agent tell me, Many years ago, he called me from San Diego, and I've told, I've said this in public many times. And an FBI agent called and warned me. He said, "When you're talking about right now," he told me this was years ago. He said, "Right now, when you're talking about government, you, your government does not see you as any uh, real problem right now. But when you talk about the church, especially the Catholic Church in America, you are talking about organized crime. You're talking about mafia, underworld." Locosa Nostra, you're talking about the Roman system. And when you do that, somewhere along the line, they're going to have enough of you. So your life may be in danger, not from your government, but from the church. Because the church in America is nothing more than a criminal syndicate. And it has been raping this country and raping the poor people. And somewhere along the line, you're exposing this to get you in trouble. Not with your government, but with religion. That's what, that was the advice from an FBI agent. So I know what I'm up against. I know that most people in this country love their churches. They see their churches as the bastions of, of light and wisdom and knowledge, when in point of fact, they're nothing more than 501c3 corporations incorporated under the federal government. It's really a tragic story of where our great republic is, where our people are mentally and spiritually, and a lesson until we wake up and find out we've been had. It's over for us. America's enemies have taken us over from, from Europe. <clears throat> They've opened the doors to allow. What do you think and why do you think the, the, uh, the problem of illegal immigrants comes from? They're coming from Mexico. They're coming from across the border from Canada. What we're, what we're seeing is actually the destruction of the great republic of America. But there's a reason for it. There's something going on here, and you cannot have a new world order in which the biggest guy on the block is still too strong to submit. So you've got to destroy the great republic, which represented freedom and liberty and justice for all mankind. You've got to destroy that power, and you've got to do it in such a way that the people will never suspect what you're doing. Because if the American people ever figure out who is really doing this to us and how it's being worked and who the culprits who are destroying our great country, they are, they're going to rebel. And when they do, we've got a lot of people with guns, and it's going to be very, very unhealthy out there for everyone. So the way our country is being destroyed, it has to be done in such a way that nobody is going to really figure out the name of the tomb. And once in a while, somebody might figure a little bit of it out. They'll go to prison or be whacked. 
And so that's why I'm saying if you want to understand what's going on in America, you better look at Rome. You better look at the Roman history for the past 3,000 years. You better look at why America was founded. And you better look at the secret societies, the paternal orders coming out of Rome, because that's what's killing your country today. And we are being given basketball and soccer instead of being told who is destroying our great country. Well, let me ask you this. Another question from the chat room, which kind of goes on, on topic right now. Um, could you ask Jordan if he thinks that humans have any chance to turn the world around, or are we too far gone? Well, you're asking for a subjective opinion, and it's just my opinion. I say no. There is no possible way. For, for human life forms to to protect themselves. Let me give you an example. Uh, out in the Serengeti Plains of Africa, you see the, the thousands of, of uh, animals grazing out on the plains of Africa. You see the lions crawling very quietly. They, uh, the lions are organized. The, the animals out there grazing on the, on the, on the plains of Africa they're not only not organized, they don't even know they're alive. They're just out doing what they normally do, uh, eating, watching their young, and moving along to find more grass to eat. So they're, they're just trying to stay alive and do whatever it is they do as an animal. But the lions are different. They are organized. They know exactly what they're doing. And they're crawling quietly, and they are, they are calculating what they're going to do and when they're going to do it. Well, that's what's happening with America. The American people are so busy watching television and playing games and watching uh, all the silly nonsense of games on television. Nobody is reading. Nobody is questioning anything. We go along to get along. I do not believe, and it's just my opinion, I do not believe the human race can be saved. That's my opinion. I don't think we have a chance in hell, not at all. And the reason why is because if you try and tell people what I'm telling you, they're going to think there's something wrong with you. They're going to call the police on you. You must be an al-Qaeda or a communist or something. And uh, because you are bad-mouthing their Lord, the Lord and, and never realizing the, British, the English word Lord, look it up in an in a, uh, English dictionary, and you will find L-O-R-D was originally L-A-R-D. Uh, it's uh, it's just uh, a very disappointing in life for me to see America and where she is today and what's going on with her because I know the people do not know who the enemy is. And they will continue to crawl on their knees to their enemies, never realizing the people you're doing business with are underworld criminals coming out of Rome, Pontifex Maximus, the entire dirty system. Of the of the what we call our Senate, our Congress, up on the hill, all of this is a very ancient, evil system, and we have fallen prey to it, like all the other peoples in the world. We, as a matter of fact, we're the ones that are leading the world into all of this mess. <clears throat> so don't look for anything coming out of the churches to save anything. The churches can't save themselves. They're in, all they're doing is jumping around the stage doing dances and collecting money. <laughs> you know, and it's incredible. Just go watch TBN. Let's take yeah, another break. Fact, uh, uh, Let's take another break education. and do one, one, more se uh, one more segment on the uh, other side. Yeah. This is Truth Frequency Radio. We are speaking. And we are back on American Freedom Radio. TruthFrequencyRadio.com is the website. And we are speaking with the legend Jordan Maxwell. JordanMaxwell.com is his website. And Jordan, people in the chat room are talking about the, um, the research society that you're starting up. And they want to know how they can become a part of it. Well, just email me and tell me you want to be a part of it. Just very quick email, and then I will have in my email file, <clears throat> and then I will uh, get back to you and let you know how to do and what we're doing and when we're going to do it. Because what I want to do is I want to be, I want to start a research organization. I've been told by some of my attorney friends that there's two ways of doing business in this world, public and private. And when you're making yourself available to the public, <clears throat> government has the right to come in and protect the public from you, telling them too much they're not supposed to know. And so they can, they can come after you for talking about things you're not supposed to talk about in America. 
and they can put you in jail for talking about subjects you're not supposed to be talking about in public. And so if you think that's foolish, just try it. Like Dick Gregory says, go out and try talking about things you're not supposed to talk about and see how quick you land up in jail. So, they, But I was told by my attorney friends that if you start a research society where people have to join and ask to, to join, <clears throat> then you can talk about anything you wish and you're covered lawfully and legally. Let me give you an example. If you're a member of the Ku Klux Klan or some, uh, some racist organization of any kind, uh, you can talk all you want in your church and in your group among yourselves, anything you want to say about anybody, no matter how blasphemous it is, you have a right to talk among yourselves or to say anything you want. But if you go out on the street and start talking that way, now they're, now you're covered under law. Now the law can come in because you are now talking to the public. And they are, the government is supposedly empowered to protect the public. So as long as you keep it private, you can talk about anything you want. Well, that's what I want to do. I want to start a private organization where I can, for the first time in all these years, really say what I want to say and really expose the stuff I want to expose and be able to be a, 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 a floodgate of material, documents, pictures, all kinds of stuff that people have no idea that even exists that I've been working on for all these many years. So I, uh, all you have to do is just go on the web <clears throat> and email me. Go to my website, and you know, at the top of the page, there's a button that says uh, uh, Contact. And on the Contact page, scroll down to the bottom email. That's my personal email. And just say, you want to be a member of the research uh, club, the research organization. And then I'll have you in my emails, and then we'll be getting back to you within uh, probably a month or so. We're going to start emailing people, telling them what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. So just go on my email and go on my website to Jordan, J-O-R-D-A-N, Maxwell, M-A-X-W-E-L-L dot com. And go to contact and tell me you want to be a part of it. We'll get back to you. Excellent, excellent. Now, in relation, one other thing in relation to what we've been talking about. If you go on my website and go to what's new, uh, you will see, uh, as I said to you before, the two um, products that I think will be very important in relation to what we're talking about today. Scroll down till you see <clears throat> the two products. One is called Priesthood of the Elise, I-L-L-E-S. And this is, a, and read, there's a, there's a little bit of a caption there to explain to you what this is all about. It's three different books on typewritten. It was written many years ago on a typewriter. And it's a, it's a typewritten manuscript, but there are three separate books in one explaining all the words, the terms, the symbols, the concepts and ideas and belief systems of the hidden occult world of religion and how it impacts our political world system. And beneath that is a video I did which is called Dawn of a New Day, and it talks about everything that we've been talking about today. <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, it's all there. So Priesthood of the Illies and Dawn of a New Day are talking about uh, everything we've been talking about so far. Well, here's so, another great question from the chat. Um, what role does Sirius, the star system, play um, in the Vatican's worship system? Yeah, that's interesting because Sirius is called the dog star. Uh, there's a whole lot of information on that that I have in my, one of my computers. I've been collecting that material for years. That's a very big subject of, of Sirius, the dog star. But I think even uh, more important in relation to religion instead of Sirius is the planet Saturn. I see Saturn as probably the single most important uh is subject in world religion today. Saturn is extremely important in world religions around the earth, but especially in Judaism and Christianity. And also it, it has a, a lot to do with Islam also, but people do not know. Jews, Christians, and the Muslim world is not aware of the, of the part that Saturn plays, the planet Saturn plays in our religion of the book, from the people of the book. So that's another subject 
uh, for another time. But a well, lot of this material is on my website. All you got to do, go to jordanmaxwell.com and uh, hit the word. Uh, you'll see at the top of the page, research. Click on research, and it will take you to a bunch of boxes. And each one of those boxes are filled to the brim with all kinds of occult research on symbols and emblems, on Saturn worship. It's all right there. Just go to my website. You'll see it all right there, and I've got a lot more coming. Well, do you have any info on the Ark of the Covenant? <clears throat> oh, wow, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've got a whole thing on that on my website with pictures and, and, and documents on, on that whole subject. The Ark of the Covenant is not Hebrew. It never was a Hebrew uh, symbol ever. Ark of the Covenant was an Egyptian symbol. It was called the Ark of the Contract, not Ark of the Covenant. Go on my website uh, to jordanmaxwell.com, go to Research button at the top, and I think it's called uh, I think it's called the button I want that you need to go to is called Hidden Roots of Religion. It's on the top row of boxes, and I think that's probably one of the very first uh, entries I've got on the Hidden Roots of Religion is on the Ark of the Covenant. What is it? Who actually had the Ark of the Covenant, and uh, who actually owned it, and what is it, and where is it today? So that's on my website already. You know, the Ark of the Covenant was never Hebrew. The Hebrews borrowed that from the Egyptians. The Egyptians had the original Ark of the Covenant. That's why Steven Spielberg in his movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, do not ultimately find the Ark in the Holy Land of Israel, because Israel's nothing holy about it. There's nothing holy in Israel. The only thing holy in Israel are the stories. They're full of holes. The only thing holy in Israel are the stories. So <laughs> if you, yeah, they are totally filled with holes. None of it makes any sense. And even the best scholars today are saying that none of the history of Israel, ancient Israel, is true. None of it. Some of the best archaeologists in the state of Israel today, in one of their books called Hidden, the, the Bible on Earth, the Unearthing the Bible or the Bible on Earth, uh, with two of the top archaeologists, in Israel have written a book uh, in which they're saying absolutely nothing in the Old Testament actually happened in history. None of it. There was no ancient Israel. There was no uh, Moses leading the people out of the, from the desert. None of that actually, in fact, was historical fact. And that's, that's uh, archaeologists in Israel saying that, not me. But if you want to look at this whole subject of the Ark of the Covenant, I mean, just look at what Steven Spielberg. Spielberg is not a fool. He, he, he spends a lot of money and time on researching for his movies. And he has Indiana Jones, when they're going to look for the lost ark, uh, first place they go to, obviously, the first place you have to go to is Tibet. Why would Indiana Jones have to go to Tibet first to find the lost ark of Israel? Well, it has nothing to do with Israel. It has to do with Tibet. And so what is it, what's the symbol in Tibet? Well, once you go to Tibet to look for the lost ark, the next thing you're going to have to do is go where the lost ark is. And he goes to Egypt. And that's where they find the lost ark is in Egypt, not the Holy Land. So once you understand that Steven Spielberg is trying to tell you something, that the lost ark of the Hebrews is not Hebrew at all, it was an Egyptian symbol. And it has to do with some very ancient Egyptian magical teachings. And the Hebrews, or what we call the Hebrew establishment today, picked up the lost Ark of the, of the Covenant, or contract, and made it into a story in the Old Testament, and made it a Hebrew symbol. It's not Hebrew. It's Egyptian. Go on my website, as I said. Go to Research, and go to uh, Research button, and it's called Hidden Roots of Religion. Go through that. It's a huge amount of information on all kinds of religious subjects and that's one of the very first ones on the art. Well people in all the chat there. room people in the chat room right now are talking about the time when you met George Lucas. Can you yes. tell them can you tell <clears throat> excuse me, can you tell them a little bit about that? Yeah, I was invited to a party by Disney. Disney uh, studios invited me to a private party at Disneyland. You had to I do. I have all the ID and everything to even get in. They shut Disneyland down for a day for a huge private party. 
and there were three sections to that party. There was a general uh, section where most of the people invited were members of the news media, magazines, and newspapers, etc. Then there was a second set which you had to have ID to go into the particular section where it was for uh, movie stars, but especially for writers and Hollywood writers and Hollywood people, <clears throat> uh, you know, dealing with the storylines of movies, etc. Then there was a third section, which was only for a, a special handful of people, and I happened by chance to be fortunate enough to get that particular uh, ID. And so I was able to be there with Michael Eisner, Lucas, and uh, and all kinds of, of uh, high-powered names and uh, movie stars. And uh, I sat down, because we were eating, and I sat down at the uh, little table where Michael Eisner and, and George Lucas were sitting with uh, Roy Disney. And they were sitting eating, but there were long tables. And then the way it worked is that you just pick up what food you want and just go find a place at, this long, at these long tables. So I, I picked the food I wanted. I went in and sat down, just at eight, you know, just found a place and sat down. And then I realized I'm sitting next to Michael Eisner and across from George And uh, And so I introduced myself. They were very courteous, very nice. And uh, George Lucas said to me, uh, when I told him my name, he said, Jordan Maxwell, he said, you wrote a book with Steve Allen, did you, about something about the book your church doesn't want you to read? And I said, yes, I did. And, and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that you would have known about my book. He said, no, no, I know your name, and I know the book. And he said, and the reason why I know the book is because my wife loved the book. I don't do a lot of reading. I don't do a lot of reading. I have other researchers doing the re uh, research for me. But my wife made me read your part of this book. Uh, she thought your particular part was important, and she made me read it. That's why I'm remembering your name. So he says, so your part in that book was very important to her. And so he said that, and so that's why I remember your name. He said, do you have a business card? Yes, I did. And so we had a nice conversation. And Michael Eisner asked him, well, what are you guys talking about? And then we got a chance to sit and, and I had an opportunity to then sit with, uh, you know, and talk with Michael Eisner, president of Disney, and Locus about my work, astral theology, the symbolism of Hollywood and symbolism. Of, uh, of the world of entertainment and and my friendship with Steve Allen and all the other people that I've been uh, that I've known. So it was a very nice occasion, and uh, we we spent about 45 minutes just sitting and talking. And I, I of course jumped at the idea of getting some pictures made with them. And just one of those pictures is on my website. I got many many pictures of me with uh, with a lot of the different movie stars. But Michael Eisner and George Lucas were very, very nice. I mean, I really liked them because they were very kind and very courteous, but they were also very well informed. They were very well informed. The stuff I was talking about, they understood. They, they, you know, they, they would say things like, yeah, we, we're not bad. You know, I understand that. Um, so, you know, it just tells me that, uh, that the people behind the motion picture industry and entertainment in general, they're not stupid. They know where these things have come from. It's just the people, the ordinary man in the street who doesn't know. Absolutely. People in Hollywood who write these movies. who And I go to a bookstore all the time in, in, in Hollywood that's a very big for writers, people, and the motion picture and television field. Uh, it's, it's, it's what I guess you would call an occult bookstore. It's called Bodai Tree Bookstore. And it's filled with all kinds of interesting books on religions and cults and secret societies and religious stuff. It's a very, very interesting store. And I go there all the time, and I always happen by chance to meet some writers. They recognize me. We sit and talk about some movies or television shows they're doing. So, yes, I know a lot of the people in Hollywood cause, because I should. I've been here for almost, I've been here for 51 years. So I've, I've met so many people in Hollywood. They know who I am. Many people are aware of my work in Hollywood. A lot of my stuff has been uh, mimicked in uh, in motion pictures. 
So well, let me let me lot. ask you let me ask you this. Uh, now that we're on the topic, another question from the chat: uh, Have you seen the TV show V and the oh, uh, yes. yeah, yeah the episode yeah. where the the aliens are passing out booklets, um, <laughs> the dawn of a new day? That's why. And so uh, my 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 video came out about four months before that. I didn't know anything about the. Uh, I didn't even know they were filming it, uh, or making that television series. But I've been working for over forty years on the subject. Uh, and I finally got an opportunity to put it all together into a video, which you can which you can purchase on my website. Uh, go to What's New, or go to the store. It's the one and the same thing. Go to What's New and scroll down. You'll see Dawn of a New Day. And uh, in that, I talk about the symbol of the Dawn of a New Day, what it means to the world communist movement. It's a communist symbol for the collectivism of the whole human race under a totalitarian regime. And uh, and all the documents are there, all the pictures are there. I did a whole thing on that. Then, like four or five months later, uh, comes uh, the um, the television show V, and that's one of the main things in the whole V series is talking about the dawn of a new day. And I, I was shocked when I saw that. I thought, my God, that's what I've been talking about for 40 years. I finally put a video <laughs> out, and there it is. Now it's everywhere. Now you're beginning to see the communist term dawn of a new day because it's straight out of communist uh, philosophy, straight out of the Soviet communist system, that term, that secret term that's called dawn of a new day. It's a communist symbol. It means something to the communist world that most Americans have no idea in the world what it implies and what it means. I did. I've known about it for 45 years. But yes, that's in uh, it's in the V series, Dawn of a New Day. It was shocking to me. There it is in your face. Let me go back. Let me go back to a law question. I know we're we got about eleven minutes left in the broadcast. So guys, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to all your questions. But um, somebody's asking about the definition of a human being in Black's Law Dictionary, uh, being yeah. a monster, and a monster, of course, somebody who can't own property. Is right. that still accurate? Um, oh yes. Oh yes. Absolutely. It's still accurate. Though they have toned it down, you know that was for the, uh, years ago, before when the population was totally oblivious to life and nobody was reading anything. Uh, but now that people are starting to wake up, uh, the, the dictionaries are changing some of the terms and words, but the concept is still very much lawful and legal concept that human beings are in fact maritime advocate products. We are referred to as monsters. One of the biggest uh, employment agency in the country is called Monster. Putting people back to work is a big company called Monster. Why? It's because we as human beings, the very word human being uh, lawfully means someone who does not have the right to own land. And this is why when you sign any kind of, uh, of a uh, document or you're filling out any kind of an application, they will always ask you if you're male or female on your driver's license to male or female. But if you go back to the British uh, language and you will find out uh, there's a book out, I can't remember the name of the book, it's, it's a textbook on how words are used in the English language, what they mean lawfully. And according to the law of language, of the English language, uh, male and female applies to an animal only. To humans, both a man and a woman are referred to lawfully as masculine and feminine. Masculine and feminine for man and woman, but for animals, male and female. That's the law in English language. So when you, on your driver's license, on your insurance, or anything uh, where it says male or female, it's telling you, you are an animal. You are a maritime admiralty product. You came out of your mother's water. You are a water product. And, and so that's the way the law works. That's a whole story in itself, the occult world of law. I mean, why do you go to court when you play basketball in the court? That's why you go to court. You play tennis on the court. And how do you play tennis on a court? You play with a racket because the whole thing is a racket. They don't use these <laughs> words by chance. They don't, use, they don't dream up these words and use them. Uh, and never suspecting what they mean. My God, you need to wake up and find out the words that are being used in courts and commerce and banking and government. 
are well thought out terms that mean something. When you say I'm a human being and I have human rights, that's right. You have what is called human right. You have a human right. You have the right of a human, which is a animal. You are male and female, like a dog. Well, so let me that's go. Why you have, you know, today we talk about the children of Israel, but but we don't have children. We have kids. So they ask you, well, how are your kids? Kids are baby goats. They're not children, they're kids, they're goats. You are a maritime admiralty product. And we use these terms all the time, never realizing that the way government and insurance companies and the, and the 14th Amendment, the way insurance companies look at us is we are nothing more than animals with a, with a, uh, you know, a serial number. This is why you have to button, this is why you have to have insurance in a car and wear a seat belt. There's a reason for that. It has nothing to do with protecting you. It has to do with the fact that your body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. Your physical body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange where they are buying and selling you like they do pigs, animals, dogs, and anything else that's alive. You are a maritime admiralty product. Your car is not owned by you. It's owned by the insurance company that actually owns the bank. And so the bank and the insurance company wants to ensure that you, as a product, uh, don't get hurt because you're supposed to be out there making money to pay your taxes. So they don't want to have to pay you to stay home. So you have to be covered by insurance and you have to buckle up so that nothing happens to your body because it's on the New York Stock Exchange. Well, let me ask so you this. All of the way, the way this world works, people have no idea in the world the way law and government really work. How do you fill out the paperwork? Is another question from the chat. Um, when you go to court, how do you plead? Um, because a, a slave pleads, a free man doesn't plead. Um, and what about when being booked? What What does one say in that situation? Well, yes. Well, I I'm not going to get into that. But if you want to go on my website, again, go to links. Because I'm not a lawyer, I can't give any advice. I'm just an educator. I'm just trying to educate people. But if you go on my on my website to links and scroll down, because of all my links are in different departments, scroll down to you see law and commerce, or commerce and law. And those links, go through all of those links. It explains everything in nauseating detail. Everything is there on the links on my website under law and commerce. So just go there and start reading. It's all there. All right. And uh, we're about to wrap it up. Let's see. I think uh, that's all the, the, the time for questions that we have. Uh, you know, let, let me go to one more. Um, it says, please ask about the ancient cultures such as Greece, Egypt, and Rome sharing themes as if it's the same families controlling all the way through. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting subject about ancient Rome. Just as today in America and, and in Europe, especially in, uh, in England, <clears throat> the Rothschild banking, the Rockefeller banking, the, uh, the, Roth, the Rothschild banking establishments behind uh, European and American governments, the real bankers behind our country. Uh, in the Roman Empire, the bankers who were the, 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 uh, the real powers of our banking in the ancient Roman Empire was the Pisos family, P-I-C-O-S, Pisos. And you can look up the research on the Arias Copernicus Pisos and the Pisos family. And they were the powers behind the Roman Empire. Uh, they were the international bankers, the international um, tricksters who were manipulating the Roman Empire from behind the scenes, just as like the Rothschild and Rockefeller were doing with our great republic today. <clears throat> so it's a very interesting. As a matter of fact, New York, uh, the New York Times and the LA Times did a three or four page article on the Pisos family many years ago. I still have the uh, the paper. It was a very interesting article about the Pisos family. So yeah, there's uh, there's all kinds of history that we as Americans are not uh, allowed to know about. You have to go looking for it. You have to work to know. Let me go to one more question. Um, Werner von Braun's secretary spoke of a possible false flag alien invasion. When we do see yeah. aliens... There is a lie being told to everyone that the weaponization of space is now first being based upon the evil empire, the Russians. 
There are many enemies, he said, against whom we're going to build this space-based weapon system, the first of whom was the Russians, which was existing at that time. Then there would be terrorists. Then there would be terrorists. Then there would be terrorists. Then there would be third world countries. Now we call them rogue nations or nations of concern. Then there would be asteroids. And then he would repeat to me over and over, and the last card, the last card, the last card would be the extraterrestrial threat. Well, you know what, that is a great question because I've been looking and talking to all the, the people in this field for many, many years. I know, I know virtually all the major names in the UFO occult field around the world. I've talked to them about this. That's a whole story in itself, and we don't have time to get into it. But I think, no, I think that there is an actual, in fact, alien presence on the Earth. I think there is an alien presence here. And uh, I could talk with you about that for another half hour, because I had a long conversation with a large group of, uh, of people uh, many years ago at a big conference I was at, and, uh, and <clears throat> all the biggest names were there. And we were talking about that very subject. And I heard that many years ago about von von Braun saying that. I have a different opinion. I think there's something more to work you know, because he was a Nazi to start with. And he was hiding a lot of information. So I don't think you should take the, the voice of a, the, the word of a Nazi just that quick. There's something more going on here that's even bigger than you think. We could talk about that another time. Absolutely. We need to do that. And anything you want to add before we wrap it up? I would say that I have some very valuable materials on my website, as you have said. Uh, I, that's what I live by. I live a very uh, mundane life. I just live my life for research and study, and I have a lot of material on my website, in the, uh, like on what's new, that I would suggest you might want to get while it's still uh, available. Because one never knows what's going on today when stuff is being taken off the websites. Uh, websites are being dropped by government. Uh, so, you know, I would just suggest going on my website and getting the materials, go through what's new, and of course the store, and you will see a lot of things there that probably you didn't even know was on my website. And uh, go through all of my links. Go through the entire website. A lot of good videos down there you need to get. So. I appreciate your opportunity, you know, the opportunity to talk with you. We appreciate you coming on the broadcast, Jordan, and hopefully we can get into the aliens on the next one. Yeah, that's a big subject, boy. <laughs> Absolutely. I do have to ask, though, because last time we had you on the broadcast, we were bombarded with this. And I don't mean any disrespect by this at all, but it's something that a lot of listeners were bringing to, to the table. Um, there's a video with yourself and Zechariah Sitchin, and there's yeah. a pretty interesting handshake there. And they yeah, were trying and, to... And let me tell you, uh, yes, I know, that's, that's nonsense. Uh, it's, it's totally, it's, uh, I was just flabbergasted when I heard people saying something about that. I was just shaking hands with an old man. I'm an old man. I shook hands with an old man. I, I don't know. I'm not going to make it to a, a very royal handshake. I was just shaking hands with an old man like I, like I do with anybody. Okay. So okay. it has nothing to do with masonry at all, but it has to do with detractors, especially religious zealots, who want to paint me as being some kind of a conspirator. And I've always felt if I was a conspirator, at least I'd be able to pay my rent. I've lived in a little one-room office with no shower, and there's a little dinky little one-room for 11, 12 years with no money. I lived on Social Security with nothing. I had nothing. I have nothing. nothing. And, I'm, and, and I'm doing, and the reason I have nothing is because I've spent my whole life doing what I do, only to have Christians and super patriots who are saying, I I'm a conspirator. It's ludicrous on the face of it. Totally ludicrous. Can okay. I just, I, live? I just wanted to get that on the record. I that, understand. <laughs> I understand. It's just ludicrous. I know. And it's detractors trying to say something about me that's not true. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Jordan, it's been great. We really appreciate it. We respect all the work you do. And we can get you back on soon. Thank you very much for the invitation to start with. Thank yep. you. You have a great evening.